In the next 14 minutes, I would like to talk to take you on a journey into the future. A future where passion determines our choices and time is the new currency. A future where we're not being controlled by technology, but technology works for us. We seldom think technology through, and it, its effects often surprise us. In 2011, we were working with um, the TU Delft, and the scientists told us that we were working with healthcare cameras. There are sensors in the ceiling, and um, in case of an in the homes of elderly people, and in case of an emergency, these sensors would call 911, will, will contact 911. And we asked them, well, actually, we sort of, wow, that's a, you, you can get a wealth of data from these the sensors. So we asked them how they would use these data or they would safeguard against abuse. And they replied to us, they never thought about the question. Another thing about technology is that everybody is now take, talking about robotization and the way it's going to take our jobs. Right? So in 2034, it is predicted that 47% of all the jobs will be made redundant. And our own Dutch government foresees in a document, uh, the, gr the Great Exodus reviewed, that in, by 2022, 300,000 jobs, government jobs, will have disappeared. So what else can we expect in the near future? When we think about energy, we'll have new ways of producing, gaining energy, and we will think about, th about other ways of storing electricity as we did now for, uh, until now. And this storage of energy will have a huge impact on, for example, mobility. Together with automated transport, uh, where no drivers needed, and, and these alternative fuels that we're currently developing, transport can be hard, nearly free, and travel can be available for everybody. Around big cities, we'll have huge glass houses and other food production facilities. Uh, together with the sustainable energy again, and the fact that there's no human involved in this labor, this kind of you know, like production, production of food, food can be really cheap, maybe even for free. So we know that robots can perform simple tasks, but scientists believe that by the time of 2050, uh, robots can actually write poetry. That means that they know about our context, they know about our language, they know about our, uh, our emotions, but they also know how to affect us. So robots are actually quite capable of performing complex tasks. And when they start working together, the question is going to be, how many robots does it take to replace me, rather than, will a robot replace me? And then, what are we going to do? In a resource-based economy, where all, where all the work is being done by robots, what is going to be our fulfillment, our mission? Are the things, what are the things we should do? So, as opposed to um, other future scenarios that are more technologically driven, like the movies The Surrogate Gets, The Matrix, or Her, we come up with a future scenario where human values are central. And we thought about freedom and meaning in life and passion. And we worked it through in four themes. Education, economy, the internet of concern, and a decentralized society. Let's start with education. As I just described, in let's say 20 years from now, half of the jobs will have vanished. So the kids that start studying right now, by the time they're done studying, they will not have a job, or at least half of them. What will you tell those kids? So we suggest that we should change the education a bit. Um, we should obviously, like everybody else agrees on, talk about language and programming and creativity, but we think that one of the most important things is going to be critical self-discovery. Critical self-discovery is something that was brought into the education since, let's say, the 1960s, where in, in the Italian town Reggio Emilia, they start developing this kind of education. And let me explain how this works simply. There's a classroom, it's filled with the kids, and uh, they bring in a moped. And everybody like, wow, this is a moped, really cool, starts driving, and you're like, at a certain moment, the bro moped breaks down. So a couple of kids will immediately grab for the tool set and they start working on it. But other kids, they'll start reading the manual, and it's in English. And halfway reading the manual, they realize 
that they're more interested in reading in English than about the moped where it, where it took off. So they're being stimulated to continue reading and read other stuff and literature. You can imagine that when this process repeats itself a couple of times in a classroom, all the kids in one classroom will do different things. They will study different things. Um, and what happens is that we end up with a classroom with all these differences. And the kids will look at each other and say, wow, you're doing something else. What are you learning? So they'll start sharing experiences and you know, like the things they've... And, 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 and they realize that everybody's different. So after that one, after the primary school, you can go to a, to a laboratory, which is more specialized, for example, a crafts lab, or you can go to a more technologically driven lab, um, like this one is a bio lab where you can do biohacking, or you can go to a sports lab where you can learn about different sports, which you can, you know, like you can learn coaching, or you can research the body or study kinesiology. What I wanted to explain here is that the education will and should change, and that we're going to replace two really important words with two other words. First of all, we'll change the words learning objectives into experience goals and accomplishments into exercises. Now, we tested this at the art schools that we're teaching. And we, to our surprise, we noticed that all students started to do more experiments and they were, as we would say, more innovative. And in the feedback sessions, they told us that they had more fun doing so because they weren't credited anymore. What about the money? Why actually should we still have money? We live in, in a resource-based economy, and the technology is going to do all wor our work. Um, why? Let me first explain what, value what, what price reflects uh, in, our, in our future scenario. Um, first of all, there's human production time. Second of all, there's sustainability and recycling. So let me sort of explain that. If I'm, I'm, I'm wearing a pair of trousers, I'm wearing them for two years, and after those two years, I return these trousers. Now, the big question is going to be, can I make another pair of trousers out of them, or do I have to recycle them into another product? Another thing that is, is important is, um, what's the value loss, or what's the impact of the withdrawal of a product from a lifeline? That sounds complicated, but it's actually quite simple. We're having a gallon of oil, we're using it for electricity purposes, and afterwards, the gallon of oil is gone. Still, uh, then we suggested everybody should have a, have a basic income. Okay, that sounds logical. No money, no, more, no money, we require, you can't get any money, you should have money somehow, right? But then why would you have money in the first place? Well, um, let's briefly talk about the, me the, the meaning of a currency or what it actually makes possible. Um, it makes it possible to exchange without a personal relationship. So if I, uh, I owe, uh, if I, you give me a product, I owe you. So I am, I'm, I'm, I'm in debt, a social debt, if you like. And money prevents that. We can be talking about transactions of products. Then what can money do? It can put a measure on, on our behavior. It can stimulate choice and invest in what we want. And how do you make money? Well, you make money by sharing time, for example, uh, by teaching, or uh, designing clothes that you sell at the Sunday market. And what can you buy with this money? You can pri prioritize your needs, you can pay neighborhood taxes, or you can invest in crowdfunding projects and, uh, 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 and the pleasures in life. Then what will the internet look like? The internet will be the internet of concern. So let's frame this ideologically first, right? Um, our lives are not about the digital, it's not about devices, it's not about things or about places. Our lives are about relations, interests, and concerns. So imagine yourself being part of a network, right? Um, the, all the entities in the network are aware of each other. They know how to act and to interact with each other. So here's, here's a simple example. You're sitting in a room, you move your chair, the, the screen will switch on, and it will continue broadcasting the series that you started over this morning. The lights will go, switch off and the curtain close. But here's the thing, your neighbor just saw another movie and the curtains didn't close at the first place. So there's some kind of awareness and intellect and everybody knows how to respond to each other personally. A bit more of a sophisticated example is this one. Peter would love to see the Mona Lisa. So um, the, he, he sends an interest agenda to the Louvre. It's always crowded in the Louvre, except on Mondays at 11 o'clock. So the Louvre notifies the neighborhood taxi and tells the taxi to pick up 
uh, uh, to pick up Peter on Monday at 10 o'clock in the morning so he and the son can then watch this fantastic painting in all quietness. The Internet of Concern is a peer-to-peer and interest-based network. That means that I, as a user, actively share information in different networks. That means that, from a network, uh, that, that means that I will be living in a network of choice rather than a network of seduction. In a decentralized society, everything is local. What does that mean? Well, let's start off with what the city does in a decentralized society. The city will make decisions in a decentralized society, like where is going to be the swimming pool or where is going to be the market. It can do so based on needs or traffic options. Healthcare will be supported with technology, so caring is going to be a social act. On a, in, in, the, in the neighborhood laboratory or the workspace, we can make use of tools, 3D printers, 3D scanners, um, and all kinds of other tools that we can use for producing, learning, working, and there we can share knowledge and our experiences. In the, neighborhood, in the nearby garden, the gardener who's growing vegetables meets the biohacker he's currently working on self-seasoning salads. The two meet, and, based on, and communities will develop based on inter, interest and expertise. All these communities will take place in a district board or neighborhood cooperation, if you like. And together, this different group of civilians will take decisions on, for example, the future of the garden, um, artworks that should be placed, or other kinds of activities in the neighborhood, uh, crowdfunding projects and, crowd and, and tax paying. So um, the neighborhood is going to be self-governing. People will take control of their own lives. So in the future, the shape of the world is determined by statistics and algorithms, but the shape of life is defined by personal interest and passion. And I would say, uh, so we have no more Monday morning blues, and we can do what we're passionate about every day. And I would say, why not start now? Thank you.